Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Futurist Society, where we are talking in the present, but talking about the future. Today, we have Lars Dierud, who is the CEO of Earth Optics, which is a really interesting company, but respectively, he's done so many different companies. I really talked to Lars about the, just his thought leader role in the technology space and how he's really trying to measure everything, everything from satellite imagery to sensors, you name it. He's got his hands in it. So Lars, tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Earth Optics. And I know that you are trying to bring on the revolution of measuring everything. So I want to know a little bit more about that and how that's going to affect our future. Thanks so much for, for having me. Um, so yeah, I've been, I'm a space scientist by training, but now I'm working in soil. And so I think throughout my career, one of the themes is I've been looking for, looking for difficult to measure, but important problems. Um, and so what we've been doing at Earth Optics is around for about five years. Uh, and one of the core things that we're really focusing on is, is trying to try to help farmers and ranchers go from food production causing about 30% of global emissions and actually make food production reducing. So we think it's something that's completely within the realm of ability and it won't even, won't even take necessarily all that long. Uh, but it really starts with measuring. Uh, you, the common phrase that you can't manage what you don't measure and soil is incredibly complex. Uh, and so for us, it starts with step one, make detailed, accurate measurements of the soil, including carbon, uh, and provide that data to other really smart people and really capable farmers and ranchers who are going to use it to start becoming not just food producers, but carbon farmers as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that the future is really uh, filtered through this lens of the environmental implications from carbon emissions. And I know that that's something that you're specifically working on right now. How are we measuring this to begin with? Like from the micro scale to the macro scale, like, like how are you doing it? How are other people doing it? That's always something that I was wanted to talk to someone like you about. No, that that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, car the earth's carbon cycle is actually incredibly complex. And the one thing that's easy to measure is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we've been making measurements, kind of the gold standard single measurement is on um, in Hawaii on the top of uh, Mauna Kea Observatory. We've been measuring since I believe the 50s, the carbon concentration several times a day. And so that part we know really well. We know that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been steadily going up. It goes up and down every every season as the Northern hemisphere goes into to winter versus summer. Um, but every year it's kind of slowly marching upwards. And so that we know really well. Uh, but one of the things that one of the fascinating things that got me into this field is every year humans have been burning about 18 to 20 billion tons of carbon uh, through petroleum, natural gas, oil, gasoline, and all the other petroleum inputs. And so that's you know that's that's what's been causing the atmospheric carbon concentration to go up. But when I got really fascinated because I'm I'm not a carbon cycle expert by training, uh, was when I learned that. Even though we're building burning this 18 to 20 billion tons per year, only about half the carbon concentration is only increasing by about eight to 10 billion tons. So half of that carbon that we spew into the atmosphere every year doesn't end, doesn't stay in the atmosphere. And so when I asked the experts, well, where's the carbon going? Uh, it's going into the terrestrial biosphere. So every plant, tree, uh, plant and tree and everything else that's on the land that we're familiar with. And the, the other half is going into the ocean. So I asked about like, all right, well, what do you mean it goes into the ocean? Does it get dissolved? Like, what, what happens? And the ocean is actually pretty straightforward. We think we understand that pretty well. Phytoplankton grow. Uh, and when they die, they fall to the bottom. They're made out of carbon. When they die, they fall to the bottom of the ocean. They stay sequestered there forever. Uh, what's a lot more complicated is the terrestrial biosphere. And so half of that excess carbon is going to the terrestrial biosphere. So in principle, it's very straightforward. It makes tons of sense. Since every single plant is built out of carbon, and that's what that's what we're made out of. That's what all plants on on the earth are made out of. So when plants grow, they take carbon out of the atmosphere. 
And so at least at the high level, what was happening is about a little, you know, they're growing a little bit more. And when plants decay, they they emit carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And so clearly, obviously, on a global scale, what's happening is there's a little bit more carbon that's staying on the ground than being emitted through that, you know, plant growth, plant decaying process. But what we don't know is, is where that's happening. We really don't have a good understanding of, of where is this excess carbon being put uh, put in the terrestrial biosphere. And then if you ask the question, what does it mean for the terrestrial biosphere to store an additional 5 billion tons of carbon every year? Uh, really, that, that's happening in the soil. If you look at the, the broad, you know, the large numbers, there's three times more carbon in the top one meter or about three feet of soil uh, than in all the atmosphere. And there's five times more carbon in that same top one meter soil than in all the plants and trees on the surface of the earth. And so if you look at that from that perspective, there's two place that, places that carbon really resides and the much larger sink is in the soil, but it's the atmosphere and the soil. And plants really cause the respiration, all the plant growth and plant decay activity is causing respiration between those two pools of carbon. And so to me, that was, that was fascinating, the fact that the soil, just even the top one meter of it, we're not talking like deep, deep, where do we get oil? Just the top one meter has way more carbon than the atmosphere, which means it could easily store the excess carbon we've been putting in the atmosphere for the last 60 or 70 years. Um, and since plants are doing this already, the plants are already been, you know, helping us out all along the way. They've been taking their four or five billion tons of, of carbon out of the atmosphere on our behalf without us even thinking about it or trying it, trying anything for it. And so I really got fascinated with the, the whole concept of, well, if we just tried a little bit, could we make that go from four billion tons a year to maybe, you know, 10 or 12? Um, clearly, the soil pool uh, can hold plenty of carbon if it's already three times larger than the, the entire atmosphere. And in fact, scientists said, you know, scientists at uh, the United Nations long worked out and even a decade ago had a campaign that just never really stuck to show that if we could just increase the soil carbon content by four tenths of one percent on all our global working lands, we would completely cancel out all our petroleum emissions. Uh, and four tenths of one percent is not that's not a crazy amount of, of carbon. Uh, so that seems totally doable. And it just to, as soon as I started reading about that, like, well, yeah, we should definitely do that. How hard can that possibly be? And, it, you know, it turns out it's actually not terribly hard. Uh, but the amount of carbon that's in the soil is only a few percentage points of the soil. And, you know, everyone has, you know, some familiarity with soil. When you think of like potting soil that you buy at the buy at the buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, it's really black. Uh, that's That blackness is carbon, right? So clay is usually gray or orange. Uh, so soil is made up of clay, sand, and silt, Neither, none of which are usually black. So when you think of black, rich soil, that's really the carbon, the organic matter that's in, that's making it look black. Uh, so, But carbon only represents a few percent, a few percent of soil. And so measuring it is actually kind of hard. You're looking, it's literally a needle and a haystack type of measurement trying to measure the human impact that we can have on carbon concentration. It changes very slowly and the changes are small, but integrated over the entire globe. Uh, it has a you know very significant impact and one that can be and is just impactful as you know, as all our petroleum emissions. And so at Earth Optics, we really focus on that, that measurement part. How can we measure soil so accurately that will allow ranchers and farmers and, and foresters to really understand the carbon impact they're making, whether it's positive or negative, and allow them to do the same thing they've done for food production for the last decades. Uh, food production has skyrocketed on a per acre basis through our innovation and our, and our, our more productive farming. We've gone from uh, if you go back 40 years, we've gone from about 30 to 50 bushels of corn per acre. We're now in some of our most fertile land in the Midwest, the U.S., for example, we're producing well over 300 bushels of corn per acre on that same acre of land. So we've gotten five, six X times more efficient at food production over the last 60 years. If we could just get a couple times more at soil carbon production with that same activity, uh, we completely reverse climate change. And that seems such a beautiful notion to me, like, wow, like, this is, you know, this is what I'm going to spend my time doing. Like, why is not everybody doing this? How come this isn't what everyone's talking about? And, and I think one of the reasons why is just the measurement part has been so hard. Well, it's hard to really understand whether you're making a positive or negative impact to soil. Um, so I've, I figured that the one part I could do is really contribute to making that measurement cost effective and, and accurate enough to, to really be useful. Um, and I think there's been a lot more, you know, a lot more people taking a harder look at this as, as really the real solution to climate change. Mm, yeah. So like I I didn't even know that, to be quite honest with you. So that's really interesting. But I I guess my question to you is that, you know, your 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 company is called Earth Optics. Like you're looking at it from 
uh, a very top down type of perspective, right? And you're sitting here and you're making these like really large measurements. Two questions that I have for you is like, number one, how much have you measured already? And number two, have you noticed any trends in those measurements? Because the reason why I say that is you hear on the news that like the soil is getting worse, that we're, you know, having all of these problems with our food production. And it, it's tough to know exactly what's real and what's not. So as somebody that is getting objective data, how, how do you feel like the, the sta status of our food production is from a soil perspective? Yeah, and so we actually make real, we have technicians all throughout the country and partners we work with using our equipment and method all throughout the world. Um, so we're physically going to measure soil and we combine it with sensor data that so we put on tractors and, and satellite data to, to make it more cost effective. But we actually go measure it. We take soil samples, we send them to the lab. That's the only way to really get that ground truth accurately. Mm. Our technology comes in because it allows us to take a lot fewer soil samples, yet still get a very accurate characterization over hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, so we're, we're making real measurements. Um, and then that's one of the parts why it's been hard and expensive. And so our focus has been like, all right, we still need these gold standard soil samples and send them to a lab. But what if we could make take, you know, 10 percent that we used to have to for the same level of accuracy? Mm -hmm. And that's where our, that's where our technology developments have been focused. Um, but, yeah, really what we're learning is we go make measurements for a lot of carbon programs. There's a lot of food companies that set up carbon programs uh, as, as part of their scope three reporting requirements, or just because they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, have a better handle on their supply chain on, on where our food's coming from. And there's what also, is, what is a scope three reporting requirement for somebody? So the, the, the Paris Accords uh, a while ago, there's a bunch of companies and countries that committed to being carbon neutral by various dates. And so the, the regulations they set up, outline scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So scope uh, scope one are your easy to measure emissions. They're your electricity or fuel consumption as part of your production. Uh, scope two is the uh, the rest of the emissions that you do from like the things that you source and, uh, and whatnot. And scope three is your supply chain. What are the emissions as part of your supply chain? So if you're a consumer packaged good company uh, or a grocer, the food ingredients that you're sourcing from farmers uh, or ranchers, that's your scope three emissions. It's part of your, it's part of your supply chain. If you're a, if you're a beverage producer, the bottles would also be part of those scope three emissions, whether they're plastic or. And so for all food, for most food production, the carbon that's sequestered or emitted as part of the food growing and, and according to, uh, ultimately the grocery store falls under what's called these scope three emissions. Mm, okay. All right. So anyway, point being is you're measuring this. What trends are you noticing? So for the for the programs where so we have, we now have a pretty pretty decent at least initial understanding of what it takes to increase or decrease soil carbon. Uh, it's imperfect and soil is highly variable. The way we got so good at food production is by farmers understanding what to do on those acres that they manage. So there's no like one silver bullet solution to say, hey, if all farmers did insert blank here, we'd solve climate change. What makes it complex is not only is it hard to measure carbon accurately. Figuring out what works and doesn't work for that particular acre, just like farmers did for food production, is really necessary. But for the programs that we're working, where the goal is to, to reimburse farmers for climate smart activities, um, we see that a lot of those programs work. Some work better than others in certain areas. Uh, but in general, we're seeing uh, anywhere from ranches to, to farms. Farmers and ranchers are able to increase in many areas uh, the amount of carbon sequestered in their soil by as much as one acre, uh, one ton per acre per year uh, mm -hmm. and carbon. So CO2 equivalent, that's more like three tons of CO2 equivalent per acre per year. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a pretty significant amount. Uh, what is the percentage like, like, like increase, would you say of sequestration then? Uh, in the, in the, so most, and this will tie into your other question. So most farming soils in the United States, for example, when the, when they were untouched prairies, most of them were holding about, that soil is about 5% carbon. Uh, and now many of those soils are two to 3% carbon. So that's what people are talking about. The soils getting degraded. Mm -hmm. uh, organic matter is critical for nutrient transfer uh, and moisture retention for soils. And so it's, it's key to food growth. Um, you know, you, you can get by with less carbon, uh, but that typically less carbon in your soil, less organic matter, uh, but that usually means more fertilized uh, place in the soil and less resistance to drought. And, and so you can always, you can grow stuff in sand if you want to, you just have to put enough, you, 
grow stuff hydroponically. You don't need any soil, but it just means you have to apply a decent amount of fertilizer uh, and the soil is going to dry out a lot easier. And so as we, you know, enter periods where we've got changing weather patterns, it makes, makes those crops a lot less, a uh, lot less resistant to some changes as well. And mm -hmm. so yeah, many of our working soils, we are sitting at a much lower level of organic matter and carbon than we used to before we started farming them. Mm -hmm. uh, and in many cases, that's that's caused its own emissions. And so scientists have estimated that globally in all our working lands, we've evaporated somewhere between 120, maybe even 150 billion tons of carbon from soils just in the last 60 years alone. And so I think to me, the simple idea is just returning soils to their original level of carbon uh, through these climates, you know, friendly practices that we're starting to learn more about. Would, would reverse several decades of climate change all on its own. So we're not even talking about doing something that's, you know, unnatural or new. It's if we could simply take, put back the carbon in the atmosphere that we evaporated from the soil, uh, we would, you know, we would dial the whole climate change problem backwards a couple of decades. Hmm. So I, I feel like there's no easy way to say this, but like I, there's, is this stuff real? Because I hear so much about carbon sequestration and carbon capture being like a pipe dream, you know, that it's, it's not, it's not like really something that is uh, uh, a viable option, but you're seeing it, right? Like objectively speaking, you're a scientist. This is something that is you're seeing from year to year based on your measurements, correct? And yes. if you are like, what are, what are some good technology, some good methods to do it that people can know about that this is like a viable option because, you know, it, it's tossed around as like this, um, this, uh, like catchphrase, you know, like, especially on the political trail these days, like everybody's talking about uh, carbon sequestration and carbon capture being kind of like a way out for changing emission standards and stuff like that. And honestly, I, I, I'm not choosing any sides. I just don't know where the science actually lies. And so somebody yeah. that has your training, how do you feel about it? Yeah, there's a couple of things. I think for when it comes to soil sequestration is probably not the right word. And I would, um, one of the things I try to get people to think about soils a little bit differently, right? There, there are carbon sequestration technologies. For example, we have direct air capture where you're literally, you know, taking air uh, and and centrifuging it and pulling the car, you know, separating the carbon dioxide from all the other gases and liquefying it and they inject it into old oil wells. That is sequestering carbon. And it's super expensive. It costs several hundred dollars per ton. Uh, but when, I, when we think about food production, farming and ranching, they're already making emissions uh, in, in many cases. In some cases, they're not. And what we don't do is pay farmers and ranchers for when they're sequestering carbon versus when they're emitting it. Um, that's not part of the economics today. And I think once we make it part of the economics and understand when we're when we're emitting carbon and when we're sequestering it in our food production, we can we can manage our soils significantly more effectively from a carbon perspective than we do today, which is in most cases nothing. We do we do nothing to to manage soil organic matter or carbon uh, at a widespread level. And so it's when you think about soil being or carbon being certain soil, it's less about sequestering. It's not locked in there forever. Um, so, you know, carbon that's in the soil, at least, you know, maybe a couple of feet, that is, it is pretty old typically. If you do carbon dating of organic matter in the top one meter of soil, you'll find that once you get down below half a meter, about a foot and a half, that carbon there is like 500 years old. You go down to a meter, it's like a thousand years old. So that mm -hmm. the carbon that's sitting in soil, a meter, meter deep represents organic matter. That was a plant that was growing about a thousand years ago. That's, mm -hmm. that's the rate at which it like cycles down lower in the soil and that like the soil actually builds up over time. So it, at some level it is, there is, you know, it's kind of sequestration, but really what we're talking about is how can we manage our food production that, you know, critically includes the soil in a way that has more net carbon going into the soil than it has leaving it. And so it's a continuous management problem, not one of like, oh, I just got to do this one thing once and then I don't have to worry about that carbon anymore. Mm -hmm. Our food production is already responsible for 30% of emissions between soil and transportation. And so we, it's, it's not something that we can't not do something about we have to we have to make our food production system more uh less carbon intensive but soil represents such an awesome opportunity we can make food production carbon positive they can actually contribute to all our other all our other emissions if we manage the soil uh optimally and mm -hmm. so to me it's what one what is needed to manage a particular acre in a particular climate optimally and that you know that, that requires data to understand what's working and what's not working 
But once we see people are doing that and figuring out what's working through the programs that we make measurements on, yeah, it's 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 a it's a pretty significant reversal. We, we've seen you know ranchers who are overgrazing uh, overgrazing areas and they're losing about a half a ton of carbon per acre per year and completely reverse that within a few years to gaining a ton of carbon per acre per year. Wow. Uh, and there's we operate on such massive amounts of land globally. A scientist just reported about about three or so years ago that humans are now doing something on 51% of the terrestrial biosphere. So we're, we are managing, we are the majority shareholders of the terrestrial biosphere now. It's not not just mother nature doing her thing. It is for 49%. We literally have 49% of the land that's untouched by humans. And it's just mother nature doing whatever mother nature is going to do. But we're responsible for that other 51%. And if we don't understand whether our management is degrading or evaporating carbon rather than increasing carbon, that's you know that's a really huge missed opportunity from my perspective. So we we work on so much land from our forests and grazing land and and row crop food production. We we have access to more than enough acres to I think review re completely reverse the other human impacts and, and emissions. It's just about figuring out what works and and implementing it. Yeah, I love the fact that like I can just tell the optimism in everything that you're talking about. I think that I agree. I think that there's so much pessimism associated with the idea of environmental changes in the next 50 years. And I think that that's really not giving humanity enough credit. Like, I think that we are going to figure a way out of this, whether it comes from soil or whether it comes from, you know, uh, renewable energies, whether it comes from, uh, you know, changing to electronic vehicles, who knows, you know, I mean, all of them have pros and cons. I'm not going to say one is right, but I think that there's, a lot of ingenuity and innovation that's happening in this space and that's exciting to watch i guess my question to you the having spoken with a lot of different people who are trying to innovate this space many of the uh the futurists that i've talked to are really uh bullish on alternative food technologies like artificial meat or um you know I, for a for a while they were talking about hydroponics and you know vertical farms being the next big thing, but I think that that's kind of still has yet to produce a reliable economic model. I know it's not really uh, the only thing that you're focusing on, but just from a general perspective, you're kind of closer to the ground than a lot of other people that are listening to this. How do you feel about those different technologies? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some food production technologies that will that will benefit, like vertical farming. I think we'll get the economic model figured out, and that you know that's fantastic from a a fresh fruit and vegetables perspective of growing them more locally. And I mean, right now we truck a lot of, um, I'm on the East coast, you're on the East coast. We truck a lot of food from California all the way across the country to get here. And that, you know, that has an inherent level of emissions associated with it. And so if some of those fruits and vegetables could be grown locally, right at, you know, right at our grocery store, that would be an obvious, you know, reduction in emissions. I think what's but a very small amount of our calories are ever going to come from that type of stuff. The bulk of our bulk of our global calories are going to come from traditional food production on farms and on ranches, uh, and that's just because you can't you can't compete with free water and free you know the free nuclear reactor in the sky that provides Absolutely. energy for all these things. Uh, it's just it is the cheapest, most it's the only practical way to actually you know feed the eight billion people on this planet. I think mm -hmm. uh, tying in your comment on pessimism. Yeah, I think it's really unfortunate, especially with a bunch of the younger folks. And, you know, and it's it's people my generation and older that are responsible for, I think, a lot of that pessimism, because I think there's a bunch of misguided, misguided people who are really concerned about climate change and appropriately concerned. But they thought the solution was scaring people into action. And a lot of that action that they ask people to do is like, oh, we need you to go without these things that you enjoy and love. And and. I don't think that's ever worked in, in the history of humans to get people to do stuff by scaring them into action, maybe for a very short period of time, but it's never a long-term solution. I think like you've got to paint a better picture of the future of what, what is, you know, what is living on earth without climate change look like? Why is that something that we need to go get as opposed to saying, Hey, you've got to, you've got to live without these things. And, and I don't think we have to live without these things. Like even all the, the tiny your, 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 your uh, point about, you know, new food technologies, I people demonize meat all the time. And I don't, and I think that's actually misguided as well. When uh when European settlers got to the United States, we actually had more large hooved animals roaming the plains than we do today. There were a lot more buffalo. There's the scientists think there's about 35, 38 million buffalo roaming uh the Great Plains in the United States and in southern Canada when, when settlers arrived and and unfortunately started killing them. 
have about 30 million cows today in those same across the same country. Uh, so we have less large hooved animals. And so large hooved animals, you know, there's all these jokes about cow burps and, you know, and there's no doubt that methane from, from cattle uh, contributes to climate change. But in my view, it's a necessary contribution. We need large hooved animals. Our ecosystems that we inherited required large hooved animals. And so the prairies were designed to to burn every five, you know, five to 10 years uh, and sweeping wildfires. That's why they didn't have trees on them. They were designed to have large roaming herds of buffalo mm. eat every single blade of grass and uh, and quite frankly, poop all over the place and then move on to some new location. And so all that, you know, all that impact. So the, the hoof action pushes seeds into the ground. And so if you don't have, you don't have animals that are heavy walking around pushing seeds into the ground, you only get grasses and plants that grow that don't need to be pressed into the ground. And so that that changes our ecosystems. And so I think it's less about like, oh, we have to, we should go without meat. I don't even think we should be going out with going without meat per se. Everyone who wants to be a vegetarian can and should. But our ecosystems need in the US need, you know, 35 million large hoofed animals roaming around. So to me that all right, we've got to learn to deal with the amount of methane emissions that that number of animals make, but they always have been making those emissions. And so we've got to make sure we're managing our ecosystems. We're, we're free raising cattle when possible. We're not, we're not feeding them corn and, and small pens to the extent possible. We're letting them do the thing they were designed to do in the ecosystems where, where they mostly belong. Uh, and so that, that, I think that's a great example of trying to paint a picture of the future that, you know, that is better, right. Of having healthier meat from happier cows that were, you know, that were free range produced and same with dairy. If we can have more free range dairy production, that's better for our ecosystems. It's better for our environment and doing so uh, we can graze cattle, both dairy and beef producing cattle using techniques that mimic the way Buffalo roamed the great plains. It's called intensive rotational grazing where you pack the cows together and you force them to stay in one spot that the herds just naturally did with herd mentality. They, they show up some spot, they eat all the grass and then, some number of members of the herds decide it's time to move on somewhere else and they would all move rapidly on somewhere else. And so you can mimic that traditional buffalo behavior with, with intentional grazing where you're actually moving the cows in some cases several times per day, uh, but letting them intensively graze just like they would in a, in a natural environment. Mm -hmm. That's it's very beneficial for carbon production in the soil. And yeah, in, our, in, in the Northern areas of the country, you can easily get one, maybe even two tons of carbon sequestration in the soil with that type of grazing methodology. And in the Southern states, as much as like half a ton uh, mm -hmm. per acre. And so it's wow. about how can we understand how nature works and, and, and actually try to produce food in a way that's closest to the way it was traditionally working before we came and, and changed everything up. Yeah, no, that was really interesting. And I love how when you were painting the picture about that stuff, I could tell that like you have taken a lot of satellite imagery because like, you were just talking about the rolling hills and everything like that. And that's actually another thing that I wanted to talk with you about because the uh, one of the one of the many contributions of of uh, your technological career is that you've been helpful in you know satellite imagery, machine learning to process that and then to gain some sort of insight from that, right? Which I did want to talk with you about because I feel like the uh, bounty from that technology has really not been realized to its full extent. I think that for for like an introductory person, a lay person like myself, GPS technology is what I think about when I think about like the benefits of satellite technology, right? And I, that's there's no data that's analyzed in such a way that we gain insight from that other than just like traffic patterns, right? But there's just so much stuff happening from that macro perspective that, you know, I don't know about. So tell us a little bit about that, about, you know, where you see satellite technology evolving in the future. You know, like the when we think about the technology of satellites, I feel like it's like either GPS or like spying on people. You know, those are the two different technological groups from te satellite technology that I know about, but what are some other things that you think are coming down from the pipeline from that vein of technology that will really produce a lot of tangible benefits for lay people like myself? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the, in the space science by training, I spent most of my early part of my career in designing satellite systems. Um, so it's certainly something that's near and dear to my heart. And so much has been changing over the last decade. I mean, we've NASA and the European Space Agency have been have been launching Earth observation satellites for for 50 years now. Uh, 
and we dramatically increase the amount of measurements we take of Earth from space. And it, space is a really convenient place to, to make measurements of Earth, right? You can put a single camera in space and orbit the Earth and you can take a picture of everywhere on the globe, right? That, that's a pretty awesome like leveraging capability, right? So if you build a sensor that can measure something and are able to put it in space, you can now go global with that single single sensor and single measurement. And so we've just been first, you know, with first at our government agencies and NASA and ESA, we've been ex dramatically expanding the amount of measurements we make. But even still, we were barely scratching the surface. And so if you go back just 20 years, uh, just take imaging, for example, the non-spy satellite imagers, which are, are very high resolution, they don't actually measure useful Earth stuff. They're designed to get really high resolution picture, but it's like looking through a soda straw. But LAN, uh, US has launched Landsat for now 50 years, where we've been making consistent measurements of the Earth's surface uh, at a pretty coarse resolution, 30 meters. And so, um, you know, that that's how big each pixel. So that's pretty coarse resolution, but we've been making global measurements using the Landsat system consistently covering the earth every two weeks, you get an update. Now clouds get in the way, but it's spanning the entire earth once every two weeks. But when you still even think about that, like an image of the earth, including clouds updated only once every two weeks, a very coarse 30 meter resolution that that has phenomenal impact and potential. You can you know, see ecosystem change. You can see cities crop up where than it used to be. Um, but there's still a lot that it's leaving out, like an update once every two weeks. And even on top of that, most of these satellites to create a consistent shadow angle. Uh, and because clouds globally are a little bit less at 1030 in the morning, they're in a single what's called sun synchronous orbit. So they, they're orbiting the Earth such that when they look down, it's 1030 local time, wherever they are. Uh, and so that we have a lot of data about the earth at 1030 in the morning. Uh, and so one of the things that are now changing just in the last 10 years is the amount of satellites we've launched, you know, has gone up about a factor of a hundred times per year, just in the last 10 years. So we, we're, we launch a hundred times more satellites per year than we did 10 years ago. Uh, and wow. that's going to continue to grow because satellite technology has gotten so low cost as it's gotten, as small satellites have gotten commercialized just in the last couple of decades. And so now we're doing things instead of imaging at 30 meters once every two weeks, there are commercial satellites that are imaging uh, and, and more government satellites too, that are imaging the earth essentially once per day. Mm -hmm. uh, and increasingly at different times besides 10 30 in the morning. Uh, and we have Im radar imaging technologies that can see through clouds that still give you information, um, you know, regardless of whether there's cloud cover or not. You can think of some of the places that you visited uh, and, and it's cloudy almost all the time. So it's really hard to get information in some of those spots. There are certain places in Earth uh, on Earth where you get like a at 10 30 in the morning, it's cloudy like 350 days a year. And so like you're not going to get a lot of information in there. So these new technologies are always, you know, always going to be beneficial. So we're we're just dramatically growing the amount of data we're producing on the Earth's surface, which helps, you know, feed folks like myself and a whole bunch of other people working with that data set to help us understand how humans are in, impacting the planet and how we can do things more, more effectively and sustainably. Yeah, but like also the amount of data now has the ability to be processed by machine learning and not human beings. So I, I feel like the exponential increase in technological benefit is we're right on the cusp of that. Oh, and absolutely. So knowing that, like, what do you think are some things that are going to trickle down to just everyday people? You know, I think that I think that one of the in most interesting things that um, I think about with like satellite technology is, you know, GPS and full self-driving, right? I mean, that's just like such a, that's such a, like a basic understanding, right? Like I think full self-driving is going to be huge. Don't get me wrong. Like I think that full self-driving is going to change the way that we have um, a daily commute. I think it's going to have an interaction with, our, uh, you know, our social life in such a way that that's going to be like protected time where we're going to have more valuable time available to us. But again, it, I feel like it's just like such a small niche. And I don't know enough about satellites to know what are some other benefits of it. So what do you think are some benefits that you or your family are, are going to see down the line? Yeah, I think just the, you know, as we transition to this, and you hit it right in the head with machine learning, like, because who has time to look at an image of the earth every day, uh, right? No, no, nobody does. Nobody can actually do anything useful with that, but machine learning can. Machine learning has time to process, you know, high resolution imagery of the entire earth every day and other type measurements that are useful. So I think just having this ubiquitous and constantly updated global intelligence will, will drive change in every single industry that we're familiar with. Uh, and, you know, and it already is in farming, for example, right? Like you're worried about, 
pests coming in. So right now we use a lot of a lot of pesticides to to manage manage crops. But if you could catch them early with you know satellite high resolution satellite imagery designed to identify certain pest pressures right away as a small little location popped up, then you can go do something about it. Then you don't need to spray your entire field. You can spray it a quarter acre as that grows. Um, and so that you know that's one obvious way that it will impact and benefit farming. But I think just just imagine knowing everything you would ever need to know and having that be translatable through machine learning to actionable information on on every location on earth, right? You know, how busy it was on any particular moment of time. Like how busy is this parking lot? Like just knowing that, ask be able to ask that question anytime, anywhere, uh, right? And having that available via imagery. I'm just understanding like you're managing your yard. You know, there, you'll have high resolution imagery that's updated daily of, of your yard and be able to use that to to a, a number of ways that will that will benefit you from whether it's whether it's security just you know or help manage your landscape more effectively uh letting you know it's time to time to apply a little more fertilizer so you can reduce the fertilizer you apply on your on your own lawn so the same green lawn you love um or the or let you know that the the sprinkler that you're using one of the heads is broken because over here or one of them's leaking over here because you can see it's it's much greener than the other areas and so there's all these little small ways that once you have this ubiquitous global information that machine learning can tap into, you can basically ask and answer almost any question that as long as it's visible from the surface of the earth, you'll be able to ask and answer and have answered for you anything you'd ever want to know. Mm, interesting. That's uh, like, I, I can think like I, I am a gardener myself, so I feel like that would be interesting to just have if I had even like a one acre garden, you know, I could get a lot of information for that. But like, are satellites able to really detect changes on that small of the granular of a level? And increasingly, they will. So our resolution. So one thing that's true with all these satellites getting launched and the cost coming down, the resolution of the the spatial resolution of the data we gather, like I said, forty years ago, it started at a pixel size of thirty meters. Now mm -hmm. we're capable of getting down to uh, getting down to thirty centimeters and beyond. Thirty so centimeters. 30 centimeters from satellites. No, so that's, get that's currently out of here. We can get way wow. lower than that, but that 30 centimeters is regulated by the uh by NOAA and the Commerce Department. So you're not, it's illegal to operate and possess commercial imagery better than 30 centimeters. That's an international oh, treaty. Really? Oh, so it's not even like a I didn't just didn't even know that was capable, but like interesting. Yeah. Wow. So they, they 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 keep lowering it. It used to be one meter and they lowered it to 50 centimeters and now 30 centimeters. And now I think they've just lowered it a lowered it a little bit again. And so it's now it's not starting to be able to compete with like aerial imagery from a resolution standpoint, but it's so much more cost effective to collect uh, than aerial imagery because you don't have to fly a plane, you just launch a satellite and takes pictures continuously. Right, right. Our resolution is going up and our, what they call revisit, how frequently those images are updated are just going up and up and up almost exponentially. Yeah. How do you feel about just the amount of satellites and their contribution to people that are, you know, stargazing and stuff? I, I feel like I, I hear online every now and again about people that are complaining about, you know, the the um, Starlink satellites and how they affect the, the view of uh, the rest of the cosmos. What is your take on that? They're pretty small, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you can't really see them. I mean, you can uh the iridium satellites are a lot larger for example and given you can get the solar panels the right configuration that you can uh you can see glint from the sun off the solar panels uh, mm -hmm. but beyond that yeah the you know space is really big and there's not that much stuff up there i know people yeah. are i spent some of my career working on space the space junk problem or the, how to handle that and We've been dealing with pretty smartly, actually. So all these new satellites, like Starlink, everything, they go up in what's in a very low Earth orbit, actually. And there's actually the atmosphere doesn't just stop; and it just exponentially decreases as you get higher up. So there is atmosphere up at you know 300 kilometers altitude and 400 kilometers altitude. And so there is nothing, anything that's launched below about 500 kilometers altitude or so um, will naturally degrade due to just drag from the tenuous atmosphere that's up there in less than 25 years. And it'll burn up in the atmosphere, and so oh, it, really? it's yeah, it's a little bit. It's it's okay. It's okay to be a little bit more of the wild west than it, than it currently is. There's no permanent like space junk problems we're going to create as long as all the stuff we launch is at pretty low elevation. Yeah, this might yeah, be a big temporary problem. problem where the, yeah. the collision can cause a real problem and it creates junk that will will ruin just, the whole orbit for a couple of decades. But it's not like a it's not this existential thing like oh we've permanently ruined space. You can do that if you go higher up. You can permanently ruin space. 
uh, at much higher altitudes. Like we have geosynchronous satellites that are there's an there's an orbit that once you're 6.6 Earth radii away from the surface, uh, that that orbital period is 24 hours. And so if you launch something into that orbit, it literally hovers over the same spot on the Earth forever. Uh, and that's that's where all our satellites originally went. That's where all our TV satellites are, our original communication satellites, because uh, it's pretty straightforward doing. That's why you can have a satellite dish that just points in one spot and doesn't have to track and move. And so a lot of our new technologies we've developed have made low Earth orbits called, you know, a few hundred kilometers off the surface, practical things like communication and radio and television. And that's a lot more sustainable place to be. Because if you have a collision at a geosynchronous orbit, it will ruin that. It'll be, you know, it'll be covered with space junk for millennia. Yeah. Yeah. And for the rest of human existence, there'll be a bunch of junk unless we figure out how to go, like, clean it all up. Mm. So, I mean, how realistic is that, though? I mean, are, are collisions happening up there like is that something that collisions do happen really need to collide. worry about yeah yeah i don't know how much we worry about it the uh, russian satellite collided uh had a collision a couple of years ago and i suspect they're just doing it on purpose to test uh, and so that is the probably the biggest concern is people doing it on you know countries doing it on purpose to gain an advantage against uh against you know the united states in particular that dominates mm -hmm. like satellite technology and satellites in space. And so a really way to really easy way to asymmetrically reduce that advantage is to just well, blow it's, it's easy to blow up a satellite. It's hard to clean up the right, right. So how far away do you think we are from global internet? You know, when I'm in the bush in Zaire, am I going to be able to connect to Starlink? How far away are we? Yeah. I mean we're we're there right now. And yeah. so yeah Starlink is Starlink is probably the number one, but even Iridium has been around for a long time. You've been able to access the internet with Iridium and make voice calls for several decades now. It's just kind of expensive and the bandwidth was low. Yeah. The Iridium constellation that launched a few years ago, uh, but Starlink has really taken it to that next level. Uh, so there's just going to be more and more Starlink satellites launch, more and more competitors. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another company that's launching a few satellites right now that directly broadcasts into to 5G. So you can actually, their goal is to just be able to directly communicate with satellite fans. No specialized technology necessary, and so yeah, I, we're we're there right now, kind of, and only a few years away from from probably being direct direct to mobile type of technology. All right, so for our next podcast, I'm gonna go to Zaire, and I'm gonna have <laughs> you help me get a setup where I can do a, a Zoom conference from Zaire. Okay, sound like a plan? That sounds like a deal. Yeah, in fact, we just got Starlink for our um, our field techs because they work in really remote ranches in many cases where there's no good internet, and our software that they use. It can work offline, but it works a lot better when you're online. But just from a safety perspective, making sure they have like continuous high speed communication, you know, make sure that if they get injured, they can contact somebody uh, and make sure our apps work effectively no matter where they are. So that's just something we switched to a couple, you know, a couple months ago. Hmm, cool. Well, listen, uh, this was really interesting and I really appreciate you spending your time with us. Uh, we are getting to the end of our podcast where I always ask all of my guests three general questions just to kind of know um, what they think on a more deeper level. So I'm going to start out with where do you gain your inspiration from? Obviously, you can see by my background, science fiction is big for me. Like I, I really get a lot of interest from cutting edge technology and learning about what the future holds. But what about yourself? I mean, satellites, soil, like that's a very disparate area of interest. So what about yourself? Where do you gain your inspiration from? Yeah, I think it's probably twofold, and one of them is shared with you. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by space and space exploration, uh, and and still am, to be honest with you. And and uh, but, so, for example, my one of my lifelong goals is to make sure I go to Antarctica, the, nor the North Pole, and to space. And so, right now, I got one of those three done. But I'm I'm I've been a big supporter of commercial space industry for a long time too, and so expect to take a ride as soon as is reasonable and affordable. Uh, at least that, since my days of probably being an asset are not are long gone. Uh, so I've been heavily inspired by space and, and exploration in general. But I think that on the flip side, I've been I've been very motivated and doing doing whatever my small part is to help make the earth a better place for its growing number of inhabitants. Um, I'm not uh, like we talked about earlier, I'm not uh, not the type of person that says, oh, you need to live without. I think I want to make it I want to do whatever I can to make it sustainable for everyone to live as happy a life with the things that that they enjoy and to you know not be hungry and and not be cold or not be too hot if that's not required or necessary and so whatever innovation can do to make the world a better place uh, 
and a more optimistic place for its inhabitants uh, is something that's been been motivating me my whole life. Cool, man. That's a really interesting answer. I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, next question I always ask, specifically in your field, where do you see satellite technology? Where do you see soil technology? Where do you see something in 10 years that you think is really going to be significant for us as a species, but maybe other people might not know about it? I think the, I mean, one of the things that everyone's talking about these days, but I think the large language model, uh, you know, chat GPT and the similar models, that's a pretty big revolution. Um, and I think that combined with the type of ubiquitous data that we were talking about will will bring essentially this global intelligence to everyone who needs it. So from like where we focus on as farmers, we think there's, you know, farmers will have this, you know, voice in their ear that that tells them everything that they need. They'll have the the most intelligent, you know, collective agronomist understanding of everything that's happening. It will help them be more effective food producers with less fertilizer and less pesticides and more effective carbon uh, producers understanding just by knowing how to deal with this very diverse set of nature because they'll have all the intelligence uh, of the world and knowledge of the world described to them in their ear or on their phone and specialized and tailored for just them. And so I think it's that translation of ubiquitous information and translating that into useful, actionable advice for us individuals. That's where like first was machine learning, but now the large language models will take it that next step, uh, helping, you know, helping humans talk to us in the way that we we need to be talked to to allow us to do smart things easier, uh, better. And like, it does you no good to have all the data in the world if you can't translate that into a smarter choice yourself. And I think, yeah, yeah, large language models are helping us with that last step. And I think all that coming together over the next will be a pretty blistering pace of, of innovation. Yeah, no, I, I really, really agree with that. I can't wait until even I just have my own personal. AI assistant, I tell them, uh, the, the people who are on this podcast all the time that just the admin work of being a human being in 2024 is just overwhelming to the point where I want an assistant. And I feel like we're on the cusp of that. And that's what I'm most excited about, uh, which is kind of in the similar vein to what you said. So last question, aside from the technology that you deal with, or even some of the technology that you deal with, what are you most excited about? Um, that like you are reading in the news and you just can't put down. Uh, for me, like I think that you know the uh, the anti aging um, vein of technology right now is so interesting. As a surgeon, I feel like that's something that I even though it's uh, tangentially oriented with my field, I feel like it's something that has really piqued my interest. What is some technology or future technology that you just really are excited about? Yeah, the um, anti-aging one that, that interests me as well. Um, in general, I think probably the things that I, are capturing a lot of my attention, I'm not a biologist at all, uh, unlike yourself. So I have like zero biology training, uh, but I've really learned a lot, probably thanks to COVID, about microbiology over the last few years. That probably sparked someone like, wow, this is fascinating genetic technology. So I think uh, we already talked about it, but I spend the most amount of time like looking at large language models and understand what kind of impact I think they're going to have in the next 10 years. But the other like hobby interests I have is like, wow, our, our ability to, to measure, manipulate uh, and benefit from, from understanding DNA is just going to skyrocket yeah. over the next yeah, year. Yeah. Yeah. I, did you, did you see in the news the other day about how this guy uh, or the new sickle cell anemia uh, <laughs> genetic um, uh, therapy for it? I feel like that's something that, it's really interesting. I mean, you pay $120,000 and you're just not sickle cell anemic anymore. Like that's crazy. That's crazy to me, you know? And to think if that's one trait that we could control for, for this price that is, it's not out of this world for, you know, people who have the disease. I think that that's something that like we could manipulate any trait, right? Like, I mean, if I wanted to have blue eyes, I could just be like, well, you know, I think it's time for me to have blue eyes and I could go in and get this treatment and I would have blue eyes. Yeah. So I, I I think that that's going to be a really interesting uh, time for us as well. But thank you so much for being on the podcast. We really appreciated hearing your insight and all of the different future possibilities for us as a species. I really want to appreciate all of the listeners and everybody who tunes in on a regular basis. You know, we're growing and I can see that. And I really appreciate all of your interest. 
If you guys don't mind liking and subscribing right at the bottom, I would really appreciate it. And if you want to follow Lars on all of his social media, that will be available for all of our uh, uh, podcasts as always. Thanks again, Lars. Thanks, everybody. We will see you again in the future. Have a great one. Thanks, Dr. Awesome. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.